Good afternoon. Yes, so today we're going to talk about why Mars. And what we've heard all day, really, is a whole variety of, of reasons of why to go to Mars. And we each have, I think, our own personal reason. So I'm not going to be uh, all inclusive, but I am going to try to organize a few of the thoughts and perhaps inject a few of my own. You know, we have a strategy from the administration. Um, the Obama administration has said Mars is the ultimate destination. That strategy is because we want to demonstrate political and economic leadership. It's because we want to improve the life on Earth because of the technologies we develop as we move towards that goal. And of course, the US, through its space station and a variety of other aspects of its program, has been a leader in space and working with our international partners, uh, that's an incredibly important element of our peace strategy. There's also, obviously, practical reasons for going to Mars that we talked about today. You know, Mars is a very unique place in the solar system. It's a terrestrial planet, obviously, so is Venus, so is Mercury, but it is the planet for which we can actually walk on its surface. It has a very thin atmosphere, that atmosphere has modified its geology, its surface. It has, it has a, had a climate in the past that was much more like Earth than it is today. And so it's also a very intriguing body to understand its evolution in both its geology and its climate. Scientific reasons we heard a lot today. We had a wonderful panel, and, and they were very articulate. You know. But Mars is actually in a beautiful place in our solar system. It can tell us a lot about solar system history. So let me see if I can give you a little uh, insight to that. We all know Jupiter is the largest planet. It is an enormous body with an enormous mass. And between Mars and Jupiter is a series of asteroids, small building blocks of planets. Now, when I was in grade school, and I had inspirational teachers too, they would tell me, well, the asteroid belt is made up of uh, bodies that have uh, uh, been produced through a massive collision. Well, that's not really quite right. We now know the asteroid belt is indeed a failed planet. It is a set of material that's trying to accrete to become a planet, but Jupiter's gravity is so great that it's kept those pieces apart. It's not only done that in the asteroid belt, but it's probably affected Mars's evolution and its accretion. Uh, it's taken away mass, and the body that we know now as Mars, which is much larger than the moon, but much smaller than the Earth, it's sort of that in-between phase, was probably robbed of material. When we look out into exoplanets, and we categorize them. Are they giant planets? Are they terrestrial planets? Their sizes. What we find is the most populous exoplanet is a super-Earth, is a body we do not have in our solar system. Super-Earth is perhaps uh, one and a half to maybe as much as 10 times the mass of our own Earth. So, by studying Mars, we're going to try to understand how our solar system may be unique from that aspect, from its origin, from its evolution, and where it fits in uh, in, in terms of uh, the life question. You know, it has a well-preserved record of its climate and its geology. We today look at Mars at a snapshot in time. It's arid right now. But we now know, based on curiosity observations, that it was, uh, had a significant amount of water in its past. What's changed over that time period? Can what happened on Mars happen to Earth? That's a very important question. Scientifically, we want to know. Perhaps right now it may seem unimportant, but it probably is something that will happen to the Earth at one time in its evolution. You know, um, we have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field of the Earth has protected us from extreme examples of the solar wind. But Mars lost its field early. 
With the MAVEN mission there now, what we're studying is how Mars loses its atmosphere to the surrounding solar wind. It's naked to that solar wind. And under extreme pulses from the sun, coronal mass ejections, high-speed streams, what gets stripped away? And perhaps it's only a few huge storms in a thousand-year period that does significant erosion of the atmosphere to bodies without magnetic fields. Perhaps that's what's happening. We would like to know. As our field is changing now, perhaps going through a reversal, there'll be a period of time when the Earth will have a very low field. Geologic record says that that will happen. It's occurred many times in its past as the dipole flips from north to south and south to north. And during that flip, is it one year, 10 years, or 1,000 years? All we can tell from the geological record is it's quick. But in that 1,000 years or more, the sun could be very active. The indications are uh, we don't know enough about the sun even to determine what will happen in the future. So indeed, studying Mars is critical for us to understand how the Earth will evolve in the environment that it's in. Mars provides an opportunity to possibly answer the question of the origin of life. If we think of life occurring here on Earth, that moment at 3.8 billion years ago, did that moment happen on Mars? Do you know where you can go to find the oldest rocks on the Earth? perhaps close to 3.8 billion? There's only a few places. The Earth has been very active. It surfaces through plate tectonics, uh, through um, uh, the weathering, through the biosphere has literally eroded the past. But on Mars, where we sit with curiosity, we're in a location that's changed little in perhaps 3 billion years. We believe there are places on Mars that we can go to and we can understand perhaps that's the moment life started on Earth. Did it start on Mars? That's incredibly exciting scientifically. So Mars is indeed the most accessible place that provides us the opportunity to perhaps answer the question, is there life beyond Earth and it's a wonderful destination to go to and explore. Uh, indeed, we've explored it a lot. There's been a tremendous number of missions. Uh, many of them have failed. Currently, this is a history chart, a family portrait, if you will, of all the missions uh, that have been launched towards Mars. Currently, today, we have a fleet of a beautiful array of missions. Our orbiters, Mars Odyssey, Mars Express, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MAVEN, Indian's uh, MOM, which is the uh, Mars Orbiter mission, and of course, as I mentioned, um, uh, Mars Express from ESA. Our current rovers are Opportunity and Curiosity. Our plans going forward, indeed, include working with ESA on their Trace Gas Orbiter, which will be launched in 2016. It's coming up very quickly. And on March 4, 2016, the window opens for us to launch InSight to Mars. InSight is a solar system explorer, exploring that history of the solar system, as I previously discussed, by understanding what a terrestrial planet besides the Earth looks like from seismic measurements and heat flow measurements. And that will be very important to understand how active Mars is today. You know, we see avalanches from space, from MRO has, has seen those. Are they caused by impacts that shake the ground? Are they caused by Mars itself quaking? Are they caused by sublimation of ice as holding material that then runs down the cliff uh, when that material uh, is sublimated away? We don't know. InSight will help us answer those questions. ESA then, as we heard, is going to launch the ExoMars rover, drill down two meters. 
getting below that veneer of red and looking back in its past and perhaps in an area where, as we go down uh, in, in the Mars soil, we might find life. That's truly then the start of trying to answer much more definitively the life question. And of course we have Mars 2020. This is our sample return. Every day we're closer to 2020 is a day we're closer to bringing those samples back. It of course will have the opportunity uh, to drill cores and cache them. Uh, if those cores indeed uh, provide us some exciting uh, tantalizing glimpses of the past of Mars that we need to bring back for further analysis, uh, then, then they are there for us to make that decision later. Mars has really lost an enormous amount of water, as we know. And, and one of the most recent set of observations actually came from ground-based telescopes, looking at the lines in deuterium and hydrogen in the polar cap, the northern polar cap. By looking at those, we can determine the D to H ratio that currently is in the frozen polar cap of water. And we understand then, if it has the same ratio in the past that the Earth has today, how much water has it lost? We have determined that it has lost an enormous amount of water. And the polar cap is probably only 13% of the total water that it once had. And so if we then put that water back, we then see that in the northern hemisphere, nearly half of the northern hemisphere could have been an ocean. This is really a spectacular set of observations and continues to move us closer to answering that question about life. Perhaps life started at the shores. Where are those shores? Where are those locations that we need to go next? And this does nothing but continues to inform us of where we're going to put 2020 down to give it the best chance of answering those questions. We now have done an analysis. This is looking for what we call special regions on Mars of what we believe the groundwater table looks like. Some of the early models uh, were, well, it's probably pretty close to the surface at the pole, but maybe as deep as 15 kilometers before below the, uh, the uh, surface at the equator. Well, we now can see that uh, at the poles, it's perhaps within three-tenths of a meter. We see regions where it's within several meters of the surface, and then as we get towards the equator, it is indeed deeper, but perhaps not 15 kilometers, maybe a matter of tens of meters. We really understand Mars and its water table better than we ever have before, and indeed, Mars has a significant amount of water still trapped underneath the surface. What about methane? We heard a little bit about that today. Indeed, from Curiosity, its measurements have indicated that there is methane, and that methane actually appears to be seeping through the surface. The location of the methane vents, as shown in the one figure on the left, which is made up of ground-based observations, uh, we see this active region in Nili Fossey. It is at least uh, 50 degrees in longitude away from where Curiosity is. And as methane is emitted in the Nili Fossey region, and it's lighter than the CO2, it pops to the top, moves above the atmosphere, goes upward. In Curiosity, down in, the, in Gale Crater, in a hole, if you will, it would have to take winds of certain uh, type to be able to bring down that methane to where Curiosity is. If you look at the wind patterns during the day, you see that the wind patterns out of Gale Crater during the day are all outward, and at night, they're inward. But nearly all the observations of the methane from Curiosity are during the day. This indicates that the methane they're observing is local, and not coming from perhaps what we thought were the main methane vents in the Nili Fossey area. This may mean that locations like Gale Crater uh, also are active. Mars is an active planet. Are they being generated by life, or 
Is it magma with water and the right minerals below the surface that is heating, creating the methane, and it's seeping through cracks uh, at Gale Crater? Perhaps we'll understand that even more when InSight lands. Curiosity is doing a fabulous job. Indeed, the scientists were cheering when, as we got below the surface, we saw gray Mars, not red Mars. We were able to see that Mars had a much more significant past than the red planet we knew of at that time. It changed everything. It allowed us to realize that in this area that was uh, water-bound, that it had the right area for the, and the right chemical ingredients to support life. They are present, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And now we found organics, too. This is really a rich planet, far beyond our dreams. As I mentioned, the next big step towards seeking signs of life for NASA is indeed the, curio uh, is the, uh, is the uh, Curiosity architecture that we're using to get another one-ton rover down on the ground called Mars 2020. One day we'll get around to naming it beyond that. But indeed has an array of fabulous instruments and a core that will core, will interrogate the whole, will recognize whether we'll want to uh, keep that core for a later return, and will cache it. And that will be a fantastic mission. We're in the process right now of determining its location, where we would like to put it on the surface. Uh, we've gone through one candidate selection workshop. We have at least 10 sites that we're gaining more information about, tasking the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to do a detailed look at these regions to inform us of what the best region is to look at. Several of these actually are fairly close together which is also really quite exciting because we might be able to uh, venture from one to another. That remains to be seen. So where are we in terms of helping humans get to Mars? If we were to look at the amount of information that humans need to be able to plan their missions adequately to go to Mars on a scale from one to 100 where we have absolutely no information. Do we have complete knowledge? And this has been quantified in what human exploration calls strategic knowledge gaps. Uh, an analysis recently says we're about here. We're near the 80% mark. We have still a lot to learn, but we have the missions we believe to be able to close that gap significantly. We are nearly ready to go from all I can see in terms of supporting from the science directorate human exploration to this fabulous body. And of course, as we also talked about today, humans on Mars would be facilitating our science to an enormous degree. 2020, Mars 2020 may not go to those multiple sites, but humans could if they were put in the right place and look over a broad spectrum of the history of Mars, its geology, and going back to the moment. So why Mars? Well, because as a scientist, it's really that next step for finding life beyond Earth. As explorers, we can. We've seen today we believe we can find ways that make it affordable, that allow us to move humans to Mars. But there's one other underlying why that we haven't talked a lot about that I think is extremely important that we're just now starting to realize. Perhaps, as we heard earlier, it was Arthur C. Clarke's idea of, well, we can't put all our eggs in one basket or Andy Weir's idea as a computer technologist that I gotta have a backup, you know? My hard drive might fail. It's really because a single planet species cannot survive long. We've seen only in the last 
500 million years, five or six mass extinctions on Earth. If we're in it for the long haul, we have to also establish our presence in the solar system. And therefore, why Mars? And as humans, we must. Thank you very much. I can take a couple questions. Yes. So the two questions are, the first one is, uh, how would humans handle perchlorates on Mars? And it's too bad you didn't ask Brett Drake that. That would have been more appropriate. Perhaps you could ask him in the, uh, uh, in, at the break time. The second one is, what about returning those samples? Right now, in 2020, it's what we call in phase A. This is the formulation phase. And we've selected the instruments, and it's a fabulous array of instruments. What we haven't completed is the actual architecture of the sampling mechanism and its structure. There are several ideas on, on how this might occur. Uh, one idea is indeed that we uh, core and we put it in an encapsulated tube. We hang on to a number of those and then we lay it in a pile. And then for later pickup, that's one idea. In addition to that, we could have a cache or a combination of those two. What happens next, of course, is the system engineering necessary to be able to retrieve those. The system engineering has to be such that NASA, or perhaps ESA, or perhaps the Indian Space Research Organization developing a rover to be able to interface with what we've done to be able to pull the cache out and bring it to a Mars ascent vehicle. What will happen that next decade, we're just starting to realize and our international partners are part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. I think I yeah, need I've, to leave. Uh, one more question. All right, good. Where are you at? The, uh, the infrastructure we have now with the current, current rovers use uh, photogrammatic uh, technology to give a navigation solution. I'm wondering if that's sufficient for the Mars 2020 and if there's what you're <coughs> thinking for the human presence if there's going to have to be improvements or if that's proven to be sufficient for, for the current rovers and, and pretty much the standard you've set. Yeah, so currently what we're doing with Curiosity is, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the main, main camera on Curiosity is just a little taller than I am. So as it peers out, it can probably see 30 or so meters, and we can actually automate that path. Uh, I think the largest trek we've done in an automated fashion is 30 meters. Then it gets harder because we don't know the terrain very well. We have to use MRO for its high, high resolution imagery to be able to chart a course. And then of course we've seen, even though we thought this was the best way, a region that's really punched holes in the wheels. You know, we, we didn't think that that was gonna happen in, a, in, in this environment, but indeed it does. In the future, uh, Mars 2020, we believe will be roving faster uh, we, we would love to be able to have the high-resolution imagery to continue the process. Uh, we want to automate it more, and we're looking at a variety of techniques to do that. That also is under question. Now, if I was an astronaut on the surface walking around, and I would want to chart a trail, I would also want either high-resolution imaging that could be done uh, perhaps from uh, a UAV that I brought with me, or high resolution satellites that have then gone over and then, and then provided me the information to be able to chart a course. I think our future has got to be in those directions where we use a lot of other types of technologies to help support human exploration on Mars. And that includes uh, UAVs, uh, uh, helicopters, high resolution imaging, just a whole series of other technologies in that area. Uh, and we've got to figure out a way to leverage that and I think with that, thank well, you very well, much. <laughs>